So my name is Christian Zeno, and we'll be speaking on a few topics, uh, non-traumatic related in the hand. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I specialize in hand, upper extremity, and microscopic or nerve surgery. I'm part of the Orthopedic Institute of New Jersey, and we are part of the Atlantic ACO. I personally will see any patient of any age with any problem from the shoulder to the fingers, as you can see from all these pictures. Walk-ins are cool, same day, next day, no problems. I have two offices, one is in Cedar Knolls, just north of us here, and the other one is in Roxbury. I have lots of training locally, nationally, and even some work internationally in New Zealand and in Peru. I'm very fortunate, my patients write nice things about me online. I have about 90 so far. One person hated my guts, so please consider me for your patients. So today we'll be talking about carpal tunnel, trigger finger, dupatrins, veins, and if we have some time, ganglion cysts. So carpal tunnel, very common. Compressed median nerve at the carpal tunnel. The carpal tunnel is made up from the transverse carpal ligament and the carpal bones. Carpus is Latin for wrist. There's some strange pressure which causes the nerve to get irritated. It gets edematous. This decreases the microcirculation within the nerve, and this further irritates the nerve, and on and on it goes. Eventually, you may get something called dynamic ischemia, where you get demyelination, and then the axons degenerate, and then you get muscle atrophy. And in the picture, you can sort of see a little hourglass configuration. The superficial fascicles of the nerve are the ones that get aggravated first, so patients will complain of problems in the ring and the middle finger first, most common. It's usually idiopathic, but there's other reasons like trauma and some zebras, but mainly idiopathic. So the carpal tunnel has numerous contents. Obviously, there's nine tendons. Dr. Baskey's talked about that before. Uh, eight going to the fingers, one going to the thumb, and the median nerve, very important. Function of the thumb muscles and the hand and sensation to the fingers and the thumb. So. The loaf muscles, I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but the abductor pollicis brevis is a small muscle, the main muscle that you see on the thenar eminence that helps bring the thumb out of the palm. That's the one that atrophies, that's the one you see. The sensation of the hand, sometimes patients say, my whole hand gets numb. That's not really true, but that's what they experience. It's mainly the digits, the thumb, index, middle, and half of the ring. It's very rare to have a patient tell me that, hey, doc, one half is numb, the other half is fine. Fingertips, palm or cutaneous, anything in the palm, that's not carpal tunnel. Patients will complain of sensation issues far more than weakness. Numbness, tingling, pins and needles, doc. Flexion activities, reading a book, driving, using a bicycle, computer work, all can cause this. Nocturnal paresthesia is pathognomonic. You can see the way this lady is holding her pillow with the wrist flexed. That's what's pinching the nerve. Paresthesia at rest are bad. If they come and tell me I have numbness right now, I tell them we're wasting your time if we don't cut you open. Thenar pain usually is thenar weakness. Abductor pollicis brevis, taking the thumb out of the palm, not very common uh, for them to complain of that. That is end stage. So you always want to rule out, is this coming from the spine? C-spine radiculopathy or double crush could also be coming from both the spine and the wrist. You do a Sperling's test. I'm going to push down in your head. You tell me if you feel electric shooting down your arms. It's not very sensitive, but if a patient says, yeah, I feel a little something, they get an EMG. It's a very specific test. Cubital tunnel, usually at the nerve, uh, sorry, usually at the elbow. That's what cubitus means, elbow. Ulnar nerve, sometimes at the wrist, but not very common. They'll complain that their small finger is numb. Patients can have polyneuropathy as well. Do they have diabetes? Some sort of uh, pharmaceutical-related condition. And some zebras like ALS or Julian Barre syndrome. But the first thing you do, you want to look. It can be fine. But you also want to look for thenar atrophy. It's very hard to take pictures of thenar atrophy, but you can see in this picture here, the thenar muscles are not very good. And these are my hands with an old lady who came in for something else, and you could see I'm very robust, and she's seen better days. Palpation. I always ask the patient to take their thumb and put it across their palm. Push on it. Is it mushy or hard? 
And that's sort of strength testing, which we can discuss later on in the uh, breakout sessions. Sensation testing, I do something called two-point discrimination. I have a device that looks like this. I ask the patient, can you feel the two pieces close? And then I move it around to like the eight or the three, and I ask them, and they'll tell me when they start feeling one versus two. Three is normal. Sometimes patients go five, six, 10, 12. Not good. Check the other side. That's sort of an objective test. I always want to check the small finger too. Wider is obviously not better. Special tests, failings, wrist flexion. Pinels is you're tapping the nerve. It's more useful for nerve regeneration. If I do nerve repair, I want to tap the nerve. Where is the repair front? Durkin's is the best test. Nerve compression, stick your thumb right on the nerve. See what happens. Most sensitive test. Usually about 5 to 15 seconds before the patient will tell you they start feeling numbness. Obviously, if you do it all day, they're going to have it anyway, so there's some false positives in that regard. So the workup, mainly clinical and the history. Physical exam. Always want to get an x-ray. Usually it's negative, but sometimes they're going to have a bad wrist. That's why they're having a lot of pain. And then at the end of the day, electrodiagnostic studies are very important. They complement the history and physical. So you have the electromyography or the EMG. They're all colloquially called EMG, but they're not all the same. And that's the needles in the muscles. And then you have nerve conduction studies, which I think are more important. But you sort of group them all together as EMG. Surface electrodes, and they analyze motor, sensory, and mixed nerves. It's not a requirement anymore, but it can help me confirm or rule out any other suspicions I have. So non-operative treatment first line is a brace at nighttime. It improves the posture, they're not flexing their wrist. NSAIDs, mixed reviews, if they want to try it, sure, take some oxygen. Nerve glides, go to therapy and they'll teach you some strange thing to do. Move your neck over and extend your wrist and you'll feel the nerve move. Go once, learn it, most patients roll their eyes. Steroid injections, second line treatment. Very dangerous if you don't know how to do it. It can be therapeutic, they can be happy. However, the textbook would suggest it doesn't change the operative rate at a year, but that's always the second step. It can be diagnostic. If I inject you, your pain goes away, it's probably carpal tunnel. It can also be prognostic. I inject you, your pain goes away. Well, if it comes back, surgery will probably help you. So carpal tunnel release. Open is traditional, gold standard. You make an incision and you release it. Endoscopic is newer, and that's uh, a little bit more complicated, but you send in a probe underneath the carpal, uh, sorry, the transverse carpal ligament, and you release it. So which is better? It's very much debated. There's no real long-term differences between these two. Nerve injuries, pillar pain, return to work, cost, you can find a paper that proves any point you want. However, with open, we could do something called WALANT, which stands for wide awake, local anesthesia, no tourniquet. We're doing this local, like the dentist office. Endoscopic requires sedation because you need a tourniquet because you need to see what you're cutting. Uh, the New York Times uh, put an article out about two years ago about doing hand surgery with patients awake. It's the new thing. So when should you consult me or one of my colleagues? If a patient wants a brace, because it's covered by insurance. If the brace doesn't help, do they want an injection? And if they have constant paresthesia or weakness, let's talk about surgery. Now we'll talk about trigger finger. So it's a mechanical impingement or a catching of the flexor tendons due to a narrowed pulley or tunnel opening. So you can see in this diagram on the left, the pulley is normal, and on the right, it's gotten swollen, and the tendon gets caught. And it's the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. And it's the A1 pulley, what Dr. Baskey's mentioned before. It's in the palm, distal palmar crease. It's not in the finger, it's in the palm. Pulleys are fibro-osseous canals. You can see the colors on here. There's mainly five and they help balance motion and force so you can move your fingers and roll them up. And if you don't have them, you have bow stringing, so you can't move your fingers. So there's some sort of repetitive compressive load which causes uh, fibrocartilaginous metaplasia, hypertrophy, and narrowing of the tunnel. It gets swollen. So primary type idiopathic, we don't really know why it happens. Healthy middle-aged women more common than men. Multiple triggers are not uncommon. It's usually the middle two. Secondary type, it can be related with systemic diseases, gout, diabetes, renal disease, rheumatoid, and that's much higher in diabetic patients. So clinical presentation, historic. Their finger gets stuck. You can see triggering here in the image on the top. The bulbous portion has just gone out, and then on the bottom, it's gone through. 
that's very painful for some patients. And it could trigger very lightly, it can trigger real hard, it can be stuck, big presentation difference. And they can have pain at the A1 poly, especially in the thumb, and you can palpate a mass. It's about the size of a pea, and it's rock hard. There's different presentations, but basically you can see everything where the patient says it's not triggering now, but it triggers every morning to the patient comes in and they're locked. Uh, you want to rule out other causes, extensor tendon subluxation or boxer's knuckle, where the tendon pops off of the head of the metacarpal can look like triggering. Is it early dupatrins? Do they have sort of this nodule in the palm? And is there some sort of mass or ganglion cyst and not actually in a swollen A1 pulley? Physical exam, can you palpate any masses? Are they painful? Uh, any dimpling of the skin? Is it dupatrons? Uh, can they make a tight fist? Open up. Do they trigger? If they don't, well, then we try again. Make a tight fist, and I ask them to release all the fingers one after the other until the one in question, and then it usually pops. If not, you do it again, and you put your thumb over the A1, and then you ask them to pop. Check the back of the hand, too. Diagnostic studies, just get an x-ray. Usually normal. Rule out other things that could be causing them problems. Some patients who don't want an injection, I will tell them to go to Amazon, you buy this, it's $7. It prevents you from flexing, but patients really don't want to do that. Cortico corticosteroid injection is the first line treatment. I think it works wonders. High satisfaction, high success. However, it's less effective in diabetic patients. It thins the pulley, it softens the pulley, it allows everything to move a little bit better. I tell them it starts within three days. It doesn't happen immediately. It takes three weeks for maximum effectiveness, so we'll know if it works soon. And then if it doesn't, then we do surgical release. Inject the patient with local anesthesia and make a little incision. We do it wide awake. You'll go over a video in the breakout sessions. So when to consult me, if the brace doesn't help, obviously, do they want an injection? And do they want to see if the mass is something a little bit more aggressive? Uh, Dupatron's contracture. It's a benign proliferative disorder characterized by fascial nodules and contractures of the hand. You can see it pretty clearly in that picture. It's named after this French surgeon who was not the first person to describe it, but really one of the pioneers of having to surgically excise it. And if you're going to church tomorrow, everyone in church has Dupatron's contracture. The pom no, it's serious. Uh, palmar fascia becomes thickened and contractile. The fascia is what holds the skin to the muscle so you can manipulate objects. The MCPJ and the PIPs become flexed, and then you can have a contracture. It takes many years for this to happen. A little nodule, and then the cord, and now you start to contract. There's a genetic component, and it, the triggering agent is some sort of trauma or even surgery. Men of northern European descent is the primary cause. And this is uh, some pictures of uh, some Viking bones and some Viking scriptures, and they all have dupatrins. So these fascial bands become pathologic and contractile and become cords. And there's some sort of weird fibroblastic proliferation where they have intracellular contraction. So over many years, these cells and these myofibroblasts will contract using their actin. So they just complain of decreased range of motion affecting ADLs. They can't put their hands in their pockets. They can't shake hands. They can't do much. You can, you can imagine the person on the right, right picture here has a very difficult time doing many things. So they start off with a little nodule in the palms, very mild. You can see there's something funny looking right near the guy's wedding ring, not so bad. But then they become, over time, flexed from very minimal to very severe. So you can see his other hand, very difficult for him to do much of anything because it's so flexed. They can start with pits and nodules, as you can see here. And then over time, you can get cords that look like bowstring tendons. And then usually the small of the ring finger. Tabletop test is like the board question. If they can't put their hand flat on the table, that's a tabletop test. So work up, just look. It's pretty obvious there. So is there some sort of mass that you're feeling that's not actually uh, the beginning of Dupuytren's? Is there some sort of neurologic injury? Do they have an ulnar nerve neuropathy or a laceration to a nerve? Is there some sort of contracture from trauma? Do they have a locked trigger finger? That's probably what you're going to see. Some old lady who's, you know, Kids don't see her very often, now she can't open her finger. How come? That's probably what it is. And then late end stage arthritis, patients can have significant deformities there as well. So the treatment, if I see a patient with a little something, reassurance, observation, I tell them I'll see you in 10 years when it becomes a problem.
There's a new thing called Zyaflex injection, and it depends on certain degrees of contracture for the insurance company to approve it. And then there's surgical resection or fasciectomy, which is the gold standard that has been practiced for hundreds of years. So non-operative Zyaflex injection, you inject this thing called collagenase, and it's an enzyme that will dissolve collagen. And you can see here, I use a very small needle and I inject. In about 24 to 48 hours, I had the patient come back to my office to manipulate. And you can see the patient looks very beat up. This is a few days later. And basically, I open this up and you hear a pop. It's pretty scary, but it opens them up. It only digests the part where you inject. So the cord will still be there, but you sort of cut part of it so you can open them up. Unfortunately, it's a 50% recurrence in five years. That was from the New England Journal of Medicine. That's what I tell patients, but it's a lot easier to do that than doing the fasciectomy. So that's the gold standard. It takes a long time because you have to dig out the arteries and the nerves, and it's a high-strung case because you don't want to cut the nerve. And you can tell patients really don't want to have this big operation. Lots of incisions. So when to consult me, you don't know what the mass is, don't get an MRI, just send the patient to me. What could it be? Contracture is bothersome, we can observe it, or we can talk Zyaflex or surgery. Now we'll talk about decrovanes, tenosynovitis, and that's tendonitis of the extensive tendons of the thumb, that's very common as well. It's named after Fritz Decrovain, who was uh, from Switzerland, who wrote a paper on it in 1895. We don't call it tenovaginitis anymore. And it's basically these two tendons here, the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. And you can see on the uh, di diagram here, it's uh, a number one. And basically, they're in this unyielding, uh, sort of like a pulley's in the, uh, uh, yeah, sort of like a pulley, uh, osteoligamentous tunnel over the radial styloid. It's a two centimeters. It's very long. Large area of pain. The six dorsal compartments in total, we're talking about the one all the way on the right by compartment one. And in this diagram here, you could see the two tendons here. This structure is the radial nerve, so patients can also sometimes feel numbness in the back of the hand because of all the swelling is pushing on the nerve. The radial nerve is a very easily irritatable nerve. You look at it funny and it stops working. Activity-related pain, typing, grasping large objects. Patients can have vague radial-sided thumb pain. Is this a mass? Is there a cyst as well? You can see in this patient of mine, she had a little something right here. Sometimes you can develop a ganglion cyst within the sheath. So differential diagnosis, intersection syndrome is very rare, and it's where the thumb and wrist extensors intersect. Okay, what you can see here, patients will have pain, swelling, and crepitus. You will freak out the first time you see it. You're gonna say, I feel wet Rice Krispies, but there's no infection. Okay, this is not an infection. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what the hell's going on? But that's what it is, crepitus. It's usually a young man who's rowing or was doing some yard work. Most commonly, you want to rule out basilar arthritis. Those are the two things that run hand in hand, so get an x-ray. You have, either can do the Eickhoff maneuver or the Finkelstein maneuver, which is the same exact concept. Uh, I ask patients to put their thumb in their hand, and then I try to ulnar deviate, and if they jump out of the chair, that's a positive sign. Sometimes you can feel the hard bump over the radial styloid. That's just how aggravated this tissue is. You don't usually see anything on x-ray. Some patients are convinced it's a bone. It's not. So repeated tension, friction, swelling, unyielding compartment, synovitis, pain, and it keeps going on and on and on. Mommy thumb, also very common. Holding the infant's head or the bottle. You can imagine her thumb is keep extending and abducting. That's annoying after a while. And then how are you holding the head? Same idea. And it could be also related to lactation. So I see that about once or twice a month. Exam is most important. Get x-rays, usually, usually negative, but you want to rule out CMC arthritis or even some little uh, bone spur over here. So the first line treatment is a thumb spike brace. Patients usually hate this, so it has a very high failure rate. Thumb sleeve, I tell them if you want to try something that may give you a little compression, but it's not immobilizing the thumb, go on Amazon and you buy that one. It's not covered by insurance because there's nothing durable with inside it. NSAIDs, potentially that can help you. Go to therapy, learn tendon glides, sort of like nerve glides. Second line treatment is a corticosteroid injection that works very well, high success rate. However, there's a high incidence of local complications if you don't know how to give the injection. 
You can depigment the skin, especially in patients who have dark skin, and you can get skin necrosis or atrophy. Not good, not happy. Last line treatment surgery, we go in and we release it. Went to consult me, if they want a brace, covered by insurance, the brace doesn't help, we do an injection, constant pain, weakness, we talk about surgery. So if you have uh, any questions, I'll entertain some now. If not, we can move on to ganglion cysts. And this is a copy by a business card, which are outside. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Well, it's usually a, a um, personal choice by the patient. Uh, it's, if you have a way to objectively document their sensation, you can always compare one hand to the other. Have they tried the bracing? Has it stopped working? Do they want to bump up to an injection? Uh, those are the things that I would usually discuss with the patient. If they have atrophy already, then certainly they should have it released because it's only going to get worse. But it's usually a conversation I have with the patient. But if they come to me with numbness at rest, with their hand on my exam table, I'm telling them they should probably get it released because I'm just wasting your time if we do anything else. But the occasional I wake up at nighttime, that's more of a personal choice when they want to pull the trigger. Anything else? Okay. So we'll talk about ganglion cysts now. If it's, is that okay? So mucin-filled cysts arising from the soft tissues of the wrist, the hand, the finger. Very common. You can see this all the time. Not well understood, there's some sort of mucoid degeneration. Uh, Mucin-filled cysts usually arise from the joint capsule, the tendon sheath, or something like that. These are just images from uh, the textbook. Usually happens in women, but I see it in kids, I see it in men, sometimes related to a trauma. And there's this communication between the wrist joint and the cyst. It's usually a one-way valve. However, these things can get bigger, they can get smaller, they can go away, they can linger. That's your key. It's usually singular or multiloculated. They can be very viscous. If you ever aspirate it, it's this gelatinous material. It's slightly green. So dorsal wrist ganglion, the most common, about 70% of all ganglions. It's over the scapholunate ligament. However, if you get an MRI, maybe you'll find a surprise, a dorsal occult wrist ganglion that you don't see, but you see it on the MRI. It can be painful. It could also be incidental. Bowler wrist ganglion, second most common. It's on the radial scaphoid joint. It's near or involved with the radial artery, so don't stick a needle in it. You don't know what you're going to find. Palpable mass, or is it not palpable? Acute or chronic, it changes in size, that's key. Some patients, I don't like this on the back of my hand. Sometimes they're painful, sometimes they're not. It is mostly painful if it's in the fingers, especially when you have to grab things. I always tell patients it's like the um, princess in the pea. So there's one pea under the mattress, you couldn't fall asleep. You can imagine a pea in your finger. Anytime you grab something, it's going to be very painful. And some patients are concerned for malignancy. Is this tenosynovitis? Does it move with range of motion? So look at this patient's hand. Look at where the arrow is with her flex. And now when she opens up, that thing moves. If it moves, it's not a ganglion cyst. Is it a carpal boss? It's a little bit more distal than your normal ganglion cyst. You put a needle in that, it's going to just be a bone. Is it a tumor? That's very rare. Lipomas or aneurysms volarly. So if you flex the wrist, you can see it better. Does it move with grip? Does it transilluminate? If it transilluminates, it means it's a cyst filled with fluid. Mainly clinical. You want to get x-rays, but you also want to rule out other causes of trauma in the wrist or other pain generators. I like to get an MRI so we have a little bit better diagnosis. Helps me plan surgery. Where does this thing go? Where do I need to look for it? Reassurance, it may go away. If a patient comes to me and says it's been going on for a few weeks, watch it. It might go away. Uh, aspiration is okay. If it's on the back of the wrist, hit it with the Bible, is what your grandma probably said. High recurrence, because it's still there. Then you have to excise it. Recurrence is still possible, but you can see all the ways we do it. And then the last thing we'll talk about, mucoid cyst very quickly. Ganglion cyst due to an arthritic spur at the DIP joint. Patients don't like it. It's painful, a hard bump and then it becomes a quote-unquote mucoid cyst. It's not mucus, it's just that gelatinous material. Sometimes patients tell me that they put a needle in it. I don't like that. Bouchard's nose, we recently spoken about. Heberden's nose, that's where it comes from. Uh, he was from England. So you can see some 
grooving of the nail is probably best illustrated in this picture here. The bone spur and the cyst push on the growth plate of the nail, and it gets a little funny looking. Mucoid cysts are usually here, but it's not necessarily limited to the, this exact location. It's usually one side of the extensor tendon, and you have varied amounts of motion and pain depending on how bad the arthritis is. Women much more than men, usually at the DIP, get an x-ray, you can see this hand is not looking so hot. First line treatment, I usually tell patients, well, why don't you put a sleeve on it, maybe it pushes it away and you don't have to operate on it. Observation, I don't like draining it because it might get infected. Surgery, you excise it, you have to remove the bone spur, and then you have to do a little flap to close the wound when you take out the cyst. If it's very bad, you need to do an arthrodesis. Went to consult me, same thing, you don't know what the mass is, it's bothersome, and this is my card. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.